Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be, and whether you're watching live or archived. And welcome to episode number, yes, I'm looking, 80 of the Nautel TTT webinar series. TTT for Transmission Talk Tuesday. I had to read that too because we've got all kinds of names for it. I'm Jeff Welton, and uh, as always, trying to find somebody smarter than me to talk about stuff. This week, we dipped into the the uh, customer service team and drug up Adam Middlecoop. Adam, thanks, and welcome for being here today. No, thanks for having me. I don't know if I meet the criteria, but I'll give it a shot. Well, <laughs> you were the only guy that didn't say no. <laughs> criteria, it's, man. It, it's a low bar. I see Dan from Alabama's on. For those who are new to this stuff, um, we do try to make this as interactive as possible. If you go to your little control panel, there, panel uh, sinus medicine today. So if I start screwing up too badly, call 911. But uh, if uh, if you've got any questions, comments, criticisms, concerns, type them into the little question box. Hit the send button. It'll pop up on my screen. If I miss it in a drug-induced haze, it'll pop up on uh, Ed's screen, and Mr. Disembodied Voice will give me the uh, virtual shake of the shoulder. So we'll try to uh, keep it as interactive as we can. If you're an SBE rem or member, remember that uh, this does qualify for half of a recertification credit under category I. So whatever you keep that those uh, notes in, whether it's a spreadsheet or a rocket book or whatever, there, I got my ad in for the rocket book early today. Um, feel free to scribble it down. By the way, if you've got a microphone and you're not shy, then feel free to hit the little hand wavy icon you can see on the control panel there, and we will unmute you and make you part of the conversation. So today we're talking about spectrum analyzers. And it's one of those that Adam and I were kind of talking behind, and I've got a little bit of customer service background, and he's got a whole bunch of it. And uh, this is arguably one of the things we do get a fair bit of calls on. Is that fair to say? Yeah, um, it's not uncommon for people to call in asking why they're they're failing or, um, you know, what's this little spike? Why is that there? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, I, I know when I was doing it, a lot of times it can come down to how you're setting the gear up because typically, and, and especially with some of the uh, the lower uh, the lower budget ones, you you get a nice little piece of kit, but you don't get a lot of instructions on it. So uh, that's what we're going to try and accomplish today. And uh, we did get a lot of advanced questions. So I'm going to hit some of those at the moment. Some of them we'll just kind of ignore and uh, answer as we go. And uh, one or two of them we may not touch at all. Uh, but uh, the first one, so professionally calibrated with documentation. Um, Adam, there's no legal requirement for that that I'm aware of, but it, it's still a pretty good idea. Is that not right? Um, I, I would think so. Um, you know, it's you're you're dealing with trying to measure really really small things, um, and so if you're if you've got a like a slight error um, in in calibration in your unit, that can trickle out to a big error down the way. Um, plus, it's just a nice sort of peace of mind to know that yes, this is going to give me what I'm what I'm expecting to get. The biggest trouble with trying to troubleshoot stuff is when you can't trust your test equipment, um, then you have to figure out ways to, to test the test gear. Um, so if you can put that trouble off on someone else and just get back um, your unit with a fresh sticker that says good to go, at least you have one thing you can rely on rather than having to, to guess at everything. Right. I mean, what's the old joke? The guy with two meters never know. Oh, I guess it's the guy with two watches never knows what time it is. But yeah, the guy with two meters never knows what the voltage is. So same concept there too. Um, now, let's see what else we got. Uh, talking about making harmonic measurements from a directional coupler, we'll cover that. Uh, protect spectrum analyzers from hackers, ransomware, and other IT threat. And I mean, that's IT security. We've, we've covered that before. Uh, we'll probably be covering it again at some point, but that's uh, non-related to the actual act of measuring with a spectrum analyzer and much more related to how to uh, protect stuff connected to a network. Um, tell me you love the tiny SA. So we'll touch on that briefly in a bit. Um, I'm, I, I have a love-hate relationship with anything like that, and, and we'll talk about why. And uh, that comes down to the computer-based SDR low budget. Uh, so that is the bulk of it. Let's roll. Um, so the first thing, we're talking about an analyzer. And a Adam, I've got a few here. Now, that Anritsu is similar to the one you guys are still using that in tech support, right? 
Uh, yeah, it looks familiar. Might not be the exact model, but it's the idea, kind of a portable field unit. Yeah, I think you guys are using the Spectrum Master. This is the Site Master a lot of folks use. Um, I've got the tiny SA up there, and then on the left, I put up a picture of our AUI. And the AUI I just put up there because one of the things you can use that for, probably the only thing I use ours for other than HD carrier injection, is um, looking at the baseband, the, the MPX, the composite baseband. Um, Adam, now when you're doing, uh, if you're looking at the AUI and you're looking at the carrier, then uh, HD sidebands, you can look at it pretty well with it, right? But but it'd be terrible for like harmonics. It just doesn't have a span. Yeah, I don't think it goes out um, all that far. Um, I haven't actually looked at what the numbers are, but if you go into like the little gear icon, it gives you the settings to, to change um, averages and, and span and all that. Um, it definitely doesn't go up to 10 FC though. Um, no, I'm, not sure I'm, what the exact say, I'm pretty sure it's 2,000 uh, kilohertz or two megahertz. Uh, yeah, two meg. So you're, you're not even getting too far off your own channel. No, um, the it's tiny. For, sorry, sorry, it's oh. useful for, like, say, seeing your your HD carriers and stuff. And on the NVs that don't have the um, efficiency optimizer, you can use that as well to kind of tweak your HDPA volts to get the regrow skirts up to where they're kissing the mask, um, squeeze mm -hmm. a little more efficiency out of it. Okay, yeah, good. much more beyond that. Right. Now, one other thing, and, and we'd had the question twice about tiny essays, and for a general, this looks good, this isn't good, they work great. Um, I question the accuracy, and, uh, you know, especially when you get up into the harmonics. So uh, have you got much experience with them? I, I don't have a lot, but I uh, figured I'd ask. This one, no, I haven't come across one of these. Um, most of the time, I'll either be using the our field unit, or it'll be the uh, kind of the benchtop ones in the the test room, which are a little more than eighty four ninety nine. Uh, maybe shift the decimal two places over, but yeah, or, um, or and then some. Yep. Yeah. Um, and and that's uh, one of those. I mean, I, I guess you get what you pay for. Kind of does apply, but uh, the challenge with the tiny essays and anything like that. Um, number one whether or not you've got the tracking generator. And uh, tell me a little bit about the tracking generator. I know that uh, that's something that you use a lot when you're running field measurements. Uh, I'm hitting them cold here. So Adam Disney did yep. zero preparation, so I just dragged them right in. All right, well, how would you, um, so tracking generator, I'm not entirely sure what you're asking there. Well, I mean, basically tracking generator, if I'm not mistaken, just makes small signal bigger. So you can measure it better, but again, like I say, I've, that's one of those areas where I've always been weak. So we'll throw that out to the crowd. I see Dan saying that the tiny SA, here, let's go. Tiny SA doesn't play with environments with a lot of RF, so that's good to know. Um, dynamic range, Eric says dynamic range can be a little less, and the front end is, uh, again, not great in high RF. One other thing to think about, and we'll talk about it in a bit, is that typically you're not going to get down to, for example, the 300 hertz resolution bandwidth that you need to do an AM measurement according to the FCC requirements. So a lot of it will depend. Sometimes your local regulating authority will have rules on how you do a measurement. Um, let's take a flick past that real quick. And we do have a lot of terms. now. Adam, I'm going to get you to hit these and let me know if there's anything I missed. Those were what I figured the high points were for the adjustments that are pretty common to most. But uh, but yeah, if I missed anything, let me know. Yeah, no, th these are most of what you're going to be looking at. I mean, obviously, you're concerned with um, frequency. So there's a couple of ways you can set that up. Um, depends on the analyzer as well. Um, Sometimes you can you can set your center frequency and then do a span. So I want to look at the carrier, you know, plus or minus 600K. And that's an easier way to set it up. So you would go uh, frequency setting, hit your center on what you want to look at, then use the span setting. Um, for some stuff, um, like if you want to go up to, um, you know, zero, all the way up to 10, 10 FC, it's just, just easier to go to start and finish rather than trying to pick, okay, so center frequency in this case would be five times carrier, so that's going to be this, and then I'll span X amount, just say start at zero, stop at, um, you know, 10 FC. Yeah. Um, it's easier to do it that way. The end result's the same, you know, the center frequency will get calculated from that, but 
depending on what you're trying to look at, it's easier to define the start and finish rather than pick the middle and stretch out. Yeah, and um, it depends a lot on your on your specific device. Um, for example, with the uh, some of the older hardware ones with the dial, I'll set the center frequency at carrier and then set a span of uh, say 10 times that, and then use the dial to move the frequency over so that I've got one harmonic on every major division. But but again, different different devices will have different uh, procedures. Oh, yeah, granted, and all, all your ones that are kind of software based that are basically just Windows PCs with a, an application for it, um, you, know, you can just dial in pretty much any number anywhere. Um, but yeah, some it's how you set them up in terms of that will depend on the specific hardware. The end result is you're just setting a window uh, for what you want to look at. Right. And if you can line up the important notes on the division lines, that makes your life a little easier. Mm -hmm. um, RBW, that's one where um, we'll see a lot of people run into trouble. So generally speaking, um, to oversimplify it a bunch, the lower that value, the more accurate the measurement's going to be because you're looking at a lot more um, points along the uh, the span than if you have a, have a big one. The trade-off is that that measurement takes a long time because if, let's say, we're doing um, 0 to 10 FC, you know, that's potentially, at, at 98, that's 980 megahertz worth of um, span that we're looking at and so if we look at that you know 100 megs at a time that's going to take next to no time at all but if we start looking down at you know one kilohertz that's a fair amount of time to look there um, however the lower that goes the closer you're looking and the more accurate um, what you have will be video bandwidth um, it is pretty much tied to the same thing it's just a case of how clean um, it displays the image so if that's um, high value it'll give you kind of a just a noisy quick um, trace draw if you shrink that down you'll get a tighter cleaner line as well if yeah, you're so running a short short answer on that one is resolution bandwidth is how many times you measure the signal and video bandwidth is how many times you display that result that that's um, sort of how i remember it yeah more or less so the so rbw is is basically how many notches you break down your span into effectively yeah. um and so if that's too high um, you can end up, you know, one chunk of um, span that you're looking at will show, you know, might show a big energy um, similar reading there, but it's not actually across that whole area. And the big tell when we'll get people email in saying, oh, some guy came in, they did some measurements and I'm, I'm failing, you know, this and this and this by crazy amounts. Um, you can tell when the that bandwidth setting is too high because you won't have a, a sharp spike at the frequency element. You'll have kind of a big swoop because yeah. it's not actually looking here. It's looking here and saying, okay, in this whole area, there's there's an amount of energy. Um, so yeah, we'll usually um, ask people to rerun it with the trunk down, or um, or if they can get someone else to to try it. But it, it does make a nice fast measurement, um, which is. I guess why a lot of people like to go for that rather than wait six minutes for it to do one full sweep um, at a high or a low. And there, there's the other thing. Um, there are, and I've got nominal one kilowatt for FM, 300 hertz for AM. Um, if you're looking at an HD radio display, like waveform, uh, beyond that, you've got to have your averaging turned on and using peak hold. So there are two other things that I did forget to put on the slide. Yeah, trace trace detector types uh, make a difference, and I'd say we'd probably want to go with one kilohertz for FM, not watts, but that's just me being Oops. pedantic. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there's. I'll, I'll fix it before Ed publishes it. Yeah, average detectors, peak detectors, um, sample detectors—they all um, impact. It, it's basically just a determination of of how the analyzer um, captures the data for any. Um, I think Keysight calls them buckets, uh, so it's one one chunk of the span. Um, if, if memory serves the, um, well, there's positive peak and negative peak, so it'll grab the highest or the lowest value in that, that bucket. Um, average just sort of is an RMS calculation on everything in there, and then sample takes directly from the center of the bucket um, and spits it all out. So for most yeah. of our, our stuff, we're using peak just because we care about the, the highest points, um, but we do run sample for the HD calculations just to get a, I guess a more accurate, right. more believable reading of, of what you're getting. Well, and the, the spec for the HD is that you average over a 30 second span so that the number of samples you pick will basically the number of samples multiplied by the uh, trace time uh, needs to equal 30 seconds. 
Um, that that's for for what that's worth. Uh, let's see, Dan caught me on the uh, kilohertz versus kilowatt at about the same time you did. Uh, Dennis mentions the tracking generators used as a known source for filter and network measurements. So, so yeah, uh, that that was yeah. something that I totally missed. Yeah. So for for that, that wouldn't so much come up for me um, in the field. That'd be more um, whoever's putting the antenna stuff together. I would think um, you know running a sweep to see frequency response through the uh, through the output array. Most yeah. of the time I get there, everything's all plugged in and it's a case of, yeah, let's see if this is actually doing what you said it would do. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's another good point and that ties back into the uh, the RF sensitivity of some of the uh, the, the more economical models to, to put it put it bluntly. I mean, if you uh, if you're in a high RF field, then you're going to be getting all kinds of interesting stuff that may or may not be related to the actual signal being broadcast. Yeah, you can mitigate some of that. Um, there's there's a picture later on that shows kind of our, our normal setup, um, but mm -hmm. a lot of times we'll use a, a copper encased box, or sorry, a copper box um, to encase the uh, the attenuators we use to um, kind of choke down the signal going into the analyzer. And depending on the environment, if you pull the cover off of that, you'll see whoa, all kinds of stuff comes up. You put the cover on, and it all magically goes away because uh, mm -hmm. you're you're not getting kind of the ambient um, RF. Um, and taming down what you're feeding in is is very very important too because um, there are some amplifier stages inside um, an analyzer, and if you overdrive those and clip them, um, you'll end up. Oh, Sorry, that's me. This is this is going to bother me until it's created. So we're fixing right. this live and uh, job done. There, there we go. Um, yeah, if if you if you clip those um, the amplifiers in there, you're going to end up putting up square wave, um, and a square wave is basically all of the odd harmonics ever. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you can actually you can set up for a measurement, and then if you overdrive the the input, um, you'll see all the out harmonics will spike up. And if you tame down the input just a little bit, you don't overdrive those amps. Suddenly everything goes down and cleans up too, which is yeah. something I've seen a few times as well. They're like, you know, we take this measurement and you've got all all your out harmonics are just so, so terrible. Um, mm -hmm. And it, every transmitter that goes out the door, um, we run through um, a, a set of um, sweeps, plots. We run them through um, narrowband, wideband, and then we do the out to 10 FC and everything, um, well, it meets spec and the, the high harmonic stuff, it's all 80 down. So when people are saying, I just installed it, we did some measurements and, you know, you're at minus 20, you're at minus 30. Um, you know, it's a case of, you know, how is it set up? How are you doing this? Are you taming down the input signal? Are you shielding the sample? Because yeah. right. you are dealing with tiny, tiny, tiny stuff. Um, yeah, and we cover that in a bit too, so I won't yep. beat on it too much. Uh, and then reference attenuation just offsets your external. This and and here's something else, and, and the uh, the Anritzes are a great example of this. Um, I I can put 40 dB of input attenuation on an Anritzu and still overdrive the front end of the receiver with a little e bitty signal. Um, whereas that moving that to external attenuation will sometimes make a difference. And like you said, basically, uh, and, and we'll touch on, I don't want to beat it too much, but it bears repeating later anyway. Um, if you add attenuation and your harmonics don't go down by the same amount as your fundamental, then you were overdriving the front end. That's, that's my general rule of thumb. All right, moving on. So, and this is the thing we need to talk about. And this is a refresher, and I, I know anybody that's been doing this for more than a day or two already knows, but but for some of the newer folks, maybe not so much. Um, when we talk about an 80 dB down signal, that's a lot of decimal points below the signal you're broadcasting. If you're measuring off a sample port that's 50 dB down already, then you can add some more decimal points. So uh, it doesn't take too much of a mistake to uh, really throw throw your results off. And that's why when, when people ask, you know, what do you think about the tiny SA? It's like, it's great for a relative. I set it up this way and I looked and I took a snapshot. And then a year later or two years later, I set it up exactly the same way and looked and it looked different. Then something's changed. Um, would I rely on it unless I had it matched against a known calibrated device at some point? I'm probably not going to trust it out of the box. All right, um, let's see. And 
the Eric mentions external attenuators. We'll hit that in a second. Um, Dan mentions another parameter you might want to add is dynamic range. Uh, too little and the device can't do the job. And that's more a divine design function of the spectrum analyzer. It's not something you've got a lot of control over, I don't believe. Largely, um, you know, the more zeros you add to the price tag, kind of the, the more zeros you get to your effective usable range. Um, what we'll do with the harmonic uh, measurement sometimes is we'll actually notch out the carrier, take it down um, 40 dB or so with a, a notch filter, which I'm spoiling probably the next slide. Um, but it, it basically allows um, for better response um, out, of the, out of the analyzer because we're, we're suddenly not trying to reach, you know, um, we're not measuring 80, we're, we're kind of only comparing it against um, a minus 40 input. So we can make better use of what range the device has. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, by the way, I've got the questions flying by fast and furious, so I hit them as I see them. But uh, ask your boss about the Games of Thrones reference when you get off the, off the uh, webinar. And uh, we'll, we'll just carry it on from there. Anybody who doesn't know um, Adam's boss, well, we'll, uh, we'll be happy to hook you up. But uh, anyway, moving on. So where do we take this measurement? I mean, if I want to measure harmonics, you, we provide this awesome sample port in the transmitter, right? Um, yeah, for um, a mod modulation monitor, that sort of thing. <laughs> um, yeah, you're you're so you can take a measurement here. Sure, um, we haven't quantified the response um, of this port, so what may look terrible might not actually be. Um, we we don't know. Um, these these ports, same as the one on the the front of your your big stuff, um, same as the ones on all the AM gear. They're intended to drive a modulation monitor, so um, they may be um, not the cleanest signal in the world, um, and they they may have a weird um, kind of hook as you go way up in, in frequency, and though they could boost some stuff, it's just not characterized. Um, so, not there is a, a good answer for where to measure. Yeah. So best place, and we'll touch it on the on the next slide too. But the best place is either. And I mean, the FCC for AMs specifies with a uh, with an antenna a kilometer away. Um, so sometimes your local regulatory authority will tell you where you're measuring this stuff. Um, if you're looking for harmonics or, or cabinet radiation, obviously you're not looking at a port right off the filter. In that case, you're going to have an antenna and be measuring, you know, looking with a directional antenna. Yeah. Um, so, and, and we'll talk about that in a bit too, because for cabinet radiation, we're looking, I mean, I'll, I'll have a discussion about that near the end, as uh, LTE interference has become almost a, its own industry these days. Uh, and some of them, like the RF monitor sample taken off the exciter here, that's a picture directly out of the handbook, and it specifies not for measuring harmonics, you know, so that's a good thing. Um, let's see, Ron mentions that he had to get educated by our competitor service department about the fact that the transmitter directional coupler has gain with each harmonic. So yeah, again, this uh, may or may not be, as, as you can tell here, if you look at the RF sample line or the RF monitor line, those are strip line couplers, they're capacitors and inductors. So it's not going to be a, a truly linear sample. Now, this is where I quantify and backtrack on what we just said. So we do have a typical correction curve shown in the manual. This is out of the, I think it was out of the install manual, might be pre-install. Adam, do you remember? Uh, I, I know I opened all four of the manuals. All right, I opened all the manuals this morning and searched monitor until I found it because I knew I had seen it. But uh, it, it's either pre-install or install. So we do have a little bit of a correction curve in there. And that will give you at least, a, again, a general idea. But it's not going to get you down to the 1 or 2 dB level by any stretch. So you yeah. know, for that, again, antenna, a, uh, a, a line section like the uh, bird one that I've got shown on the right with a uh, Here's the other thing. If you've got a sample element with your line section, the sample element and the line section need to be calibrated together. 
And uh, if you send them into bird for the, some nominal fee, they'll send them back with a actual calibration curve, uh, similar to what we've got here, but quite a bit more precise. Um, Ron mentions that the bird sample ports are all characterized for each frequency range and line section size. So again, you know, it, it goes back to the first question we had in the advanced questions. Not just the measuring device, the spectrum analyzer needs to be calibrated, but the uh, the line section or, or whatever sample port you're using, you've got to have the correction data for it as well. Adam, anything else you can think of that I haven't uh, haven't covered? Um, no, that's, you're, you're doing a good job. You should, uh, you got a feature in this, uh, but <laughs> like even, even like, uh, current transformers and, um, external amp meters for AM stuff, um, those come as a match set, you know, the, uh, um, the probe and the, the meter, they come together. So, you know, all this stuff yep. and even looking at the, um, this sweep here, you know, from 88 to, to 108, yeah, there's about a little over, a little under two dB difference, but that uh, in that one little spot we're looking at, and that's for that one particular unit that we looked at. Um, right. You know, you've got component tolerance on all those resistors, so you know this is a you know, it's a nice rough guide, but certainly not gospel for for every single one that's out there. Um, well, that's it, and, and that's what I say. Just looking at the curve on its own, I mean, I've got a almost 20 dB difference between my uh, fundamental and about my eighth harmonic. So, yeah. you know, that, that's a fair bit of boost to have up there. So if somebody comes to me and says, yeah, my seventh is at 70 dB, it's like, did you correct for the nonlinearity of the sample part? You know, yeah. so. And we're also assuming that, that that boost doesn't end up um, overdriving the front end when it's it sweeps out to that point. So you could have extra um, noise generated from that being, having more signal than you're anticipating um, yeah. from that extra bounce spike, so. So William asks how often they need to be calibrated and uh, I'm not sure how often they, uh, whether we're talking about the um, specifically the uh, through line section or the analyzer, but uh, the, the short answer is we've got our gear on a one year, or two year calibration schedule, something like that. Uh, I mean, we've got different calibration schedules for different pieces of gear, depending on the type of use. Yeah, I mean, some stuff that's, um, well, stuff that's easy to calibrate doesn't take a long time. We'll do it a lot more often. Um, the stuff that's difficult tends to be lab equipment that doesn't lead quite so rugged a life as your old Fluke 77V. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can you can get away with um, a little more time on it. But most stuff is on a is on a one-year um, loop. Because if the cow comes yeah. back in, um, good to go. We've got a whole batch of people, the whole program that track all that stuff. There's a big database of every piece of test gear we've got with when it's due, when it expired. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, that's one of the Williams asking, should it be pulling the uh, couplers out every few years to send them in for calibration? And the short answer is ideal if you're planning on using them for any critical measurement, <laughs> like your harmonics and, uh, and spectral compliance, then probably, yeah. You know, short of having two of them and have one calibrated and sitting on the shelf and then just swap them every year or two. That sound, but that, yeah, I guess, and I mean, that's kind of, I, I guess that's the extreme case, but but that, that's uh, probably about how I do it. If I was like, using it on a regular basis, is that about right? Yeah, I'd, I'd be inclined to agree. Um, I mean, anything you're using for, for any kind of critical uh, measurement Again, you're going to want to know that you're not chasing your tail, um, adding extra filtering, checking traps, all this stuff, just to find out. Oh my, you know, I had a bad sample. Yeah. Now, so. and to qualify that, Eric makes a good point here that uh, antennas and throughline samplers do tend to be pretty stable as long as you're not dropping them or, or beating them around. They just sit there and connected. Um, granted, the throughline section, if your sample port is constantly connected to it, is going to see everything that comes back down the line from the antenna or the giant lightning rod it's all mounted on. Um, I see Mark Persons has got his hand up. So Mark, I am going to unmute you and sorry for making you wait so long. Uh, you will have to unmute yourself as well, but uh, let's see, there you are, you're green. How you doing? Oh, great, great. I've always I, been an advocate of good test equipment. Is my audio okay? You're perfect, yes. Perfect, boy, that's more than my wife says about me, but that's another <laughs> story. And, and hi to Paula, too, by the way. Oh, sure. 
but um, <clears throat> you know, you go cheap. And one of the examples of going cheap, even if you're buying a good good analyzer, is you leave out the tracking generator because it's then less money. I used tracking generators when I was a working guy frequently, and mm -hmm. and it makes so much sense for for um, looking at and tweaking filters, and especially for return loss measurements, looking at visoir on antennas for um, FMs and STLs, all that kind of thing. And, you know, I started out with an IFR A7550 analyzer, 80 dB signal to, to noise. Well, 80 dB of dynamic range, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. But in order to make FM measurements, as noted, gosh, a, um, a notch filter was required for the carrier just so I could read harmonics. And um, then I moved on to an Agilent that, gosh, it had 100 dB, so I didn't need the uh, need need the notch filter. But, um, oh, and the other thing is you always want your test equipment to be 10 times better than what your required spec is for yeah. what you're trying to measure. Uh, that's, that's always kind of been a benchmark, that kind of thing. Uh, on a lot of RF samples, I found out or I figured out or, well, got to the manufacturer and found out that 6 dB per octave is about the boost you get on harmonics. Now, an octave is like twice the frequency. Yeah. So if your FM is at 100 megahertz, well, when you're looking at 200 megahertz, you could take whatever reading you got and subtract that's 6 dB to get a real reading. And then you say, oh, I'll go to 300 megahertz and take another 6 dB off. No, an no. octave is twice the frequency. So the 300 megahertz is in between the 200 and 400. So you got to process those things in your in your brain at the same time. I do right. have... And a, if yeah. you look on this, uh, on, on the waveform I've got shown here, you can see the logarithmic scale because we've got a, a linear um, a linear frequency spacing going to the right. Yeah, so it looks like it's roughly 6 dB per octave. Hmm? It, roughly, not exactly. Well, and now I got one more quick quick story to tell. There was this transmitter, <clears throat> a, another brand, a tube transmitter that um, they said it just kept stopping, it quit transmitting, and yet there was still plate volts. And so I went there, put my spectrum analyzer on it, kind of looking for, you know, is it getting into spurs or some dumb thing like that? No, it all looked fine. And while I was standing in front of the transmitter, it quit transmitting. There was no RF output, lots of, lots of high voltage, only a little bit of current. And I looked over at the analyzer, and the display for their operating frequency in the middle had gone gone uh, to nothing and a little pip two megahertz away showed up and what it was was the exciter had moved two megahertz away in frequency and the wow. tra the transmitter had tuned circuits so that it let very little of the original frequency through but just enough of the two megahertz away so that I could see it on the analyzer. It was dip switches on the exciter that were intermittent. What an interesting troubleshooting uh, experience that was. Well, and that's a good point, though, between um, not, not even solid state versus tube, but uh, a tune circuit versus a broadband circuit will react differently. I mean, one of the earlier solid state exciters, and I'm not going to mention the brand name because there's still a ton of them out there, but uh, used to be after it get a uh, certain number of years old, it liked to broadcast on all the frequencies in the band, not not just the one. And it was because it was broadband, you could see it really easily just looking at it. And then, of course, they all passed and that was wonderful or not. But yeah, no, that, that's a good story. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Now, um, Eric has also mentioned, getting back to the calibration here really quick, and uh, this is a good answer for William, too, um, that you can have a second calibration done after a couple of years. So get your through line section and uh, sample uh, elements uh, calibrated. Do it again in a couple of years, and if the response hasn't changed more than 0.1 dB or so, 
and everything's still fine, then then you're probably good to back your calibration schedule out quite a bit. So uh, you know, again, rolling curve, you'll you'll establish your calibration uh, frequency based on how often how often it ends up needing to be calibrated. Uh, what's the FCC say? As often as required to maintain compliance. Um, they don't tell you how often that is. That's up to you. So that, that's the kind of thing we're looking at there. Uh, moving on, I've got a picture of a few, and, and Mark had uh, made a, a mention of a notch, and uh, that guy on the left is a Nautel designed AM notch filter, tunable even. Um, so you, you were mentioning, Adam, these are a lot of things that you would use. And actually, as you can tell, uh, those pictures were taken. Uh, in in the uh, test room yeah it looks like it so that that's pretty much the setup we use the analyzer is a little different now or at least it was last week when i was down there um same day sort of a switched attenuator um you know notch filter as required uh, we would have that whole work so that whole signal chain um would be encased in a in a copper box with a, a lid with finger stock and we could screw it down if need be depending on how noisy it is in the uh the room at the time because there could be you know half a dozen transmitters running um with some of the loads sitting kind of right next to where you're trying to measure so depending on how bad the environment is from an rf standpoint that uh, box is a is a lifesaver um, we usually run um, shielded like externally shielded wire um, on the sample lines just again to cut down on any pickup um, you know because as as much of the outside world as you can um, ignore uh, much like with life uh, the better better things are going to be um, and, and a lot of times and, uh, like, We'll see weird spurs. You change cable from one with a you know a steel braid on the outside, and suddenly it all cleans right up because you were just uh, picking up nonsense from the room. Right, or something as silly as uh, just a BNC connector with a, a bad shield connection. Yep. And uh, sometimes you'll end up just wrapping some braid from the uh, you know tie wrapping it to the case of the notch to the uh, each BNC going through the chain. Just weird things like that sometimes. And and again, we're looking at. 12 decimal places down in some cases. Yeah, I've seen tinfoil wrapped around um, inline BNC um, attenuators. Same idea, you're just trying to trying to keep stuff from picking up on those and getting into the analyzer that you don't you want. You heard it here, folks. Adam from Customer Service recommended a tinfoil hat for your test gear. So, um, it has to be calibrated. Uh, now, and, and the switched analyzer, and uh, I think it was Eric had mentioned earlier, might have been Ray. Um, Let's see where to go. Uh, do, 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 do. There we go. Input attenuator. Yeah, um, Eric mentioned input attenuators that uh, go down to less than the, the 10 or 20 dB values. And this K Allometrics one that we uh, have is, is great for that um, because you can do small steps as well. Um, this comes back to what I was saying before. If you have an analyzer hooked up to an antenna with a, an attenuator in line, or even if you don't, if you've just got the little coaxial plug-in 10 dB attenuators, if you have a high-level harmonic, say you've got a third-order harmonic showing at minus 40 dB relative to carrier, if you plug a 10 dB harmonic in, your carrier is going to drop to minus 10, that third harmonic should drop to minus 50. If it goes to minus 60 or 70, then you're overdriving the front end of your analyzer and you need more attenuation. Um, by the same token, if you're working on, on a high power signal, then sometimes attenuating the fundamental will help and then you set your reference level to accommodate. Um, did, I, did I cover the high points on that, Adam? Did I miss anything? Um, no, sounded good to me. That's uh, that's become my new mantra. Did I miss anything? I'm blaming the boy. The boy came home from school last week with a uh, cold and uh, cheerfully gave it to my wife, who uh, seems to have decided to share it. So uh, this is this episode is brought to you by Sudafed. Um, that's all I got to say about that. Uh, moving on. Now, one of the reasons that I beat the drum on the attenuator so much is that uh, I mentioned LTE. Have you had to have a, an LTE interference complaint yet? Uh, today, no, but yeah, in the, the last year, yeah, they, they come up quite often. So here is an example of an LTE interference complaint. And this one goes back, you can see the date stamp on it, and that's accurate, it was uh, seven or eight years ago. Um, 
and they're measuring and they're complaining about the harmonic being 70 dB down. Um, and you can also see they've got no attenuation set. Um, they were using a, um, a an antenna tuned for 900 megahertz. They were doing no fundamental attenuation whatsoever. So at that point, you got no idea what the reading is. Um, what, what's uh, when you when you get somebody like that? I mean, I, I've got uh, my own little litany, but what, what's your procedure for that, Adam? Uh, just be, you know, um, try to get as much detail as you can about the the setup they're using, because um, sometimes it's a it's a fancy antenna, sometimes it's just a piece of wire, sometimes they just put the um, depending on what, what gear they've got, um, it might have its own built-in antenna. Um, get a sense of how they're actually taking the measurement. You know, these a lot of times we'll just say, yeah, they said we're you know we're, we're minus 70. So even seeing um, the plot is is helpful too because you can see if there's any obvious signs of it, um, you know, having some setup issues or or what have you, um, and then giving you kind of our our best practices for how we measure this stuff, and then if they can try to replicate that to get a more um, reliable reading it's yeah. one, one way to say it um yeah a more a more appropriate setup to get a, a more accurate reading of, of what's actually going on um and again because these these all do um you know should be minus 80 at least all the way out here um the way we set them up and measure them in you know controlled environments so um though the other thing i would do too is that i'll just divide that um the offending frequency by the, the carrier frequency of what they're talking about. If it doesn't come out to a clean um, number, then it might be a, a mixing product with something else, which is a whole other game. Because um, most of these should land on your, your harmonic, so it should be FC times something. Um, so if, you know, let's say they're, we're calling this um, for like a, a 93 megahertz station. If I do the division, it's going to come out to something um, with a lot of decimal places. Um, so it's yeah. not necessarily them specifically that's usually that there could be a, an intermod issue with somewhere else and then that's a whole other thing to track down um right i've seen no, it happen what? too where um we were doing I was doing an fat and we noticed a weird spur it was at uh, i think it was at 700 um, but it didn't line up with any of the multiples we took a step back to think about it and then it all cleared away and it was just a um, cell phone the cell phone was too close um and that and it was picking up a little bit of that noise so you can get some weird stuff going if you're you're not really really cautious with how you're measuring all this. So, figuring out yeah. what they're measuring, how they're measuring, um, and if what they're seeing makes any sense for what they're saying they've measured, um, can all kind of guide you towards you know what's actually going on. Right. Uh, I mean, two examples come to mind. Got a call from a guy who had a uh, call, and we'd we'd mentioned uh, this last week, but it was one of those uh, phone companies that uh, their their name consists of just three letters and an ampersand. Um, so not going to identify them, but there you go. And uh, they were complaining about an interference with an LTE receiver five miles away. And uh, that is what it is. But they had another site exactly two miles away, directly in line with the one that was being interfered with. So at that point, you kind of start to wonder. And then they, they came back a little later and said, yeah, no, it turned out we had a bad receiver. So, uh, you know. That, and then another one, the guy called and he was complaining about cabinet radiation. And finally, he's on the site with his little Yagi and a uh, site master, and he's waving it around. And uh, he gets up on top of the building and he points it up at the antenna. And then he stops and kind of scratches his head and points it down horizontal and turns in a circle and gets in his car and drives off. Turns out it was a neon sign two miles away re-radiating re the signal. That, nothing to do with the uh with the transmitter site so yep. other than the fact that the site was providing the signal to be re-radiated so there's definitely a lot of a uh, lot of things that go on there um yeah and and dan mentions a really good point here and, and uh this almost gets into legal advice and i'm not a lawyer so you know i just want that to be on the record take that uh with uh, take everything i say legally is with a grain of salt but Dan mentions that the LTE guys will love to ask you to turn off your transmitter to see if the spike disappears. And, and don't, because of course it will, whether it's being re-radiated, whether it is an actual cabinet radiation, whether it's something loose and radiating on the tower, whether it's an intermod product with something completely different, you know, turning off your signal is absolutely gonna make it go away. That proves absolutely nothing. 
but it does imply a lot of guilt right off the bat. So yeah, try to avoid that if at all possible. Now, if the FCC says turn it off, that's a whole different story. They uh, carry a lot more weight than even my uh, amateur legal opinion. Um, Adam, anything else you can think of in the in the uh, LTE and cabinet radiation uh, thing? Because the, the one thing I've run into, and this would be a prime example, um, a lot of the phone company techs are pretty sharp. A lot of them a little less so, I guess like people in general. And uh, sometimes they'll show up with no attenuation and just overdriving the, the daylights out of their analyzer. So so what, again, is, is there anything that I'm missing that we should be covering? Um, no, I mean, get, getting um, as, as much information as you can about what they're using to make the measurement, how they're taking the measurement. Um, can you send me the pictures of the, of the sweeps? Like, you know, show me as much as you can. You can kind of gauge from how they respond to that, what sort of individual you've, you've got. Because, uh, you know, here's the analyzer, here's how I'm setting all this stuff up, here's what I've got for, for you know, collecting it, whether it's an antenna, whether it's, um, I'm pulling a sample off something, you know, here's here's how I'm doing it versus, yeah, I, I measured and it's bad. You know, the, the one is a little more credible than the other um, and you can kind of navigate that based on, on how they respond. But yeah, as much information as you can possibly get, um, uh, on how they're doing it, then you can see if there's anything that, that could be um, improved upon. I mean, for this one, we've got a, a nice low RBW value, but if that was sitting at like, you know, um, 62 kilohertz or something like that, um, I'd be a lot less trusting of what they're showing. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you, especially where you have a, a big wide um, sort of blob there, that's, that's more in line with um, a very high RBW value for a very fast measurement. Um, right but it's not necessarily the most accurate. Right, and I mean, they are looking at channel power here, which is a, a wholly different thing, you know, and uh, that's, uh, but again, when I see attenuation off uh, on the top screen, that tends to uh, kind of throw a red flag. So it, it's gonna vary depending, did they have external attenuation in? I don't know. Yep, yeah, yeah, or, you know, do they, is it just a really small signal anyway they're dealing with? Yeah, there's, and that's where all that, you know, how are you taking the measurement? Um, right. Tell me the story. Yeah, and this and the, the challenge and what I tell folks is that uh, the, the reason I bring this up like that is because these guys are used to dealing with milliwatts and microwatts, not watts and kilowatts. And uh, when, you know, you add, again, it's all a matter of where you put the decimal place. Oh. Yep, absolutely. Now, one thing we uh, brought it up earlier, and I'm going to click back uh, to this one. Um, so I've got a picture of an AM notch filter here. Uh, what about FM? If, if you're measuring FM, do you notch those? Um, yep, yeah, for the um, for the you know the zero to ten FC stuff, your your full harmonic sweep, um, we will use a use a notch to do the same sort of thing. Um, necessary on some analyzers, not as necessary um, with others, depending on. Um, what the dollar amount is and, and how capable the device is, but um, oh, well, I mean that all comes back to the conversation on dynamic range. So if you're, you know, if you're if you can sort of measure down to 80, um, you know, if you're trying to use that full range, um, you'll have a better time if you can shrink the window up a bit. So we'll take the the carrier down. Uh, I think our filter bottoms out like 42 down, something like that, minus 42. Um, but that definitely opens up um, a lot more usable window on the analyzer and you can get a, a better sense of what's going on. Some of right. the more expensive ones are, are good for 100, so it's not really necessary. Um, but if you're having a tough time getting a, a good measurement, um, if it's noisy in the room or if you've got, uh, you know, maybe you have to run a long um, cable lead um, just because of how things are laid out, um, doing the notch to so you're not right on the limits of what you can measure is, uh, is something yeah. we do. And I mean, that's the other thing to remember is when you do notch, pay attention to how much you're notching. And depending on whether you've got a uh, digital control or, or a dial wheel, um, then you've got to set your reference attenuation or your reference level offset, depending on your analyzer, to uh, bring your waveform back up. And at that point, you'll start to see things coming up out of the grass at the bottom of the scope. Yep. Um, Dan makes a mention back to the LTE that he tries to take a, a uh, let's take a team approach to this. Um, usually they'll find out it's test gear setup or a background or shield, but uh, 
but yeah, again, it's like I told somebody once, I said, uh, if you get an LTE complaint, the first thing you don't want to do is start thumping your chest and say, go pound sand, um, because I guarantee you their lawyers are bigger than yours are almost always. Um, so it, it's always good to sort of, I mean, general rule of thumb is that's one of those situations where it's worth it to hire a consultant, come out, run the sweeps with calibrated gear, and they, they can print out a report with the calibration and the NIST trackability on their test equipment and say, so we've determined that you're compliant with all FCC regulations. And then you can take that to the phone company and say, look, you know, we're, we're aware that you're challenging the laws of physics here. We're willing to help you out, but uh, it's not coming out of our budget. And, uh, you know, work, work away with that. Um, no, oh, Mark makes a, a really good point here too, and uh, comes back to uh, another thing that uh, Eric had mentioned before too. Eric had mentioned that uh, NRSC, um, so you're measuring with an antenna, usually a loop antenna or some antenna for measuring NRSC on AM. And again, uh, with these notch filters and attenuators, uh, they're all going to have frequency responses. And you can characterize that with the tracking generator and the spectrum analyzer. So if you've got, a, a, again, a calibrated spectrum analyzer with a tra tracking generator option, then you can do the frequency correction curve for, for your other measuring equipment as you go. So yeah, thanks uh, very much, Mark. I appreciate that. All right, we're five minutes to the top of the hour. We may break, uh, not, uh, we're not gonna break all records. We've done this before once or twice, but uh, is there anything else that you can think of that we should, uh, come up with Adam or we pretty much covered the whole ballpark um I think we've covered the ballpark as as I know it um yeah the 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 biggest challenges I see from from people in the field is um measurement setup uh, both in the getting the the unit set up correctly and with how they're conditioning the input signal um, we've seen we actually had a so a few years ago, there was um, someone with an AM, they were reporting they had all kinds of crazy harmonic content when they were doing their measurements. We actually sent someone out to, to do a set of measurements using our our gear, so it was kind of known um, equipment, so we we're not just chasing a, a dodgy measurement. Um, and then sure enough, with the the box, um, our, you know, our attenuator shield box with the cover off, it was messy as could be, put the lid on, everything settles out, gets really good, take the lid off, gets messy, put the lid on, gets good. So um, it does come down, um, largely to how you're managing what you're picking up on the way in um, you know questionable cable um, you know if you have to do four or five adapters to one cable to a joiner to you know all kinds of stuff um, everywhere you've got a connection is another spot that something can leak in um, so the more you can cover those up uh, the better mm -hmm. off you'll be and, and oh and on the tin foil hat for your connectors william wanted to know if it should be shiny side in or out well, I mean, you probably do a couple layers going both directions just so that you trap the signal in the middle, right? There you go. You're making a diode. I got it. Um, now, one other thing that kind of came to mind when you were uh, mentioning that is, um, and, and this goes back more to uh, our uh, older AM gear, but any of the AM gear, really. Um, most of our AM rigs are uh, Class D, and you, you'd mentioned this before that uh, the, uh, the the Class D stuff is uh, it's square waves, so it's odd order harmonics. So if you call me up and tell me you've got a bad second harmonic on your ND5, for example, um, the first thing that we're going to ask is if you, well, well, the first thing we'll get you to check is the RF drive duty cycle, because that's about the only thing that can cause an even order harmonic on a square wave generator is if the duty cycle isn't 50-50. Um, so that that'll get asked, and then we'll start uh, asking about your test equipment. Um, but uh, th that's about right, Adam. I mean, that hasn't changed much, I don't think, since I've left support. No, not really. Um, you can see PDM noise creep up sometimes, depending on what you're what you're dealing with, because um, we are switching the mod modulators at you know, 57k. Um, and for NX is 57, uh, but each each transmitter family is a different frequency and I just look in the book to see what it is um, but yep. you know that that can creep up if you've got uh, modulator issues the NX is actually have a minimization routine that'll run in software it'll tweak the the phases of all the modules um, PDM frequencies to, to minimize that on its own 
um, but largely, yeah, we're we're switching DC um, and then just chopping the uh, the high harmonics off to get a nice smooth smooth waveform out. So yeah, it would be the odds I would expect to see, um, not so much any even or off the um, off multiple stuff. You know, your your 2.378 harmonic stuff is is going to be oddball stuff. That's likely an external mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. Now, when you get into the FMs, especially if they're linearized for HD, then then you're getting more into a linear signal, and and that'll change somewhat. But but yeah, that that's a, a good thing to remember. All right, uh, we are pushing the top of the hour. I'm going to respect Adam's time more than I typically respect my own, and uh, see if we can't let him out here on time. Uh, as always, this webinar, like all of our webinars, will be archived, so you'll be able to find a copy of it under the resources tab on the website. Um, Waves newsletter just came out, YouTube channel. Are you guys still doing the uh, little uh, tips and tricks like uh, how to delete a preset or how to change this thing that you messed up type videos? Um, I've seen a few here and there. Yeah, there's uh, been a couple batches of those done. I did some, Ryan's done some. Um, there'll be a whole nother suite of those once we um, start going live with the, the HTML5 interface because it's going to be a, a whole new world, so to speak. Uh, but yeah, they're on the support website. Um, so support.notel.com. That's my side yep. versus his sales side. So um, It's the side you can trust versus the side you want to get in writing. Um, but uh, I'm not going to justify or uh, say which one's which. Um, online info, broadcasters dis, uh, desktop reference, Barry Michigan site, uh, broadcast engineering guide info, Facebook page for just about everything. The coolest thing about this industry is that there is no shortage of folks that are willing to help. And on that note, we're tagging the top of the hour. Adam, I want to thank you for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. No, pleasure as always. And folks, thank you all very much for tuning in. Uh, next week, uh, we'll have. Cavell, I believe, for uh, talking uh, thermography and uh, and uh, heat uh, heat measurements. So I think it'll be a lot of fun. We'll see if we can uh, not burn anything up in the process. On that note, thank you all. Have a great week. Bye now.